Good evening, class, from near, right sitting in front of me, and far from wherever you are watching. I want to give a special thank you to all of those who have written in or you've called in with a message, a question, for all those of you who have given in response to the teaching. Um, we appreciate it so much, and as you know, it does, um, we do have expense in putting this out every week for you. Um, in addition um, to you sending in your Joash chest offering in response to the teaching, you can drop it off in the drop box. You can mail it in the old fashioned way uh, to the church. We appreciate your giving. If you are in class, in person, you can just drop it in the Joash chest and just mark it what is for Wednesday night and that's what it will go for. We are going to finish up on page eight of 31 notes tonight. <clears throat> and then we are going to begin our study regarding the migration of the tribes. And we're going to take it slow. If you have a question and you're sitting in front of me and you're lost or you need clarification, all you have to do is this. I will see you. I would rather you do that than stay confused as I move on. Okay? Because uh, I know this uh, is somewhat late, heavy, heavy late. So um, do that. Um, if, there, if you have a comment, I would love to hear your comments. If you are at home, you can call in those comments or questions and we will answer those if, if it's humanly possible to do it, okay? Okay, we are on note 35. The fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, and then we'll, when we get into 32, I'll probably repeat some things. Samaria, and um, I know you've, you probably are familiar with the term Samaritan because you hear it a lot in the New Testament. Um, this Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel when the kingdom split. Okay? And remember, they split after the death of King Solomon. And then you had the southern kingdom of Judah with its capital, Jerusalem, and you have the northern capital in Samaria. Sometimes, and this will help you, because sometimes when you are reading the Old Testament books that talk, that are speaking of the northern kingdom of Israel, sometimes you will hear it called Israel. Sometimes you will hear it called Ephraim. In other words, the prophetic word would be to Ephraim and those and the Spirit of the Lord would say to Ephraim, speaking about the northern kingdom, sometimes it's Samaria because that is the capital, much as you and I might refer to the capital of the United States as Washington. Washington is doing this. Washington needs to, yes, Washington needs to get its act together. Now, we're not talking about the geography. We're not talking about the land mass. We're talking about what? The people ruling in Washington. So in the same way, often you will see the prophets refer to Samaria. There are times when it will also be referred to as Joseph. And the reason for this is the two most prominent tribes in the northern kingdom of Israel were Ephraim and Manasseh, who were the sons of Joseph adopted by Jacob Israel. So Whenever you see those terms used in the Old Testament scriptures, know that it's referring to the northern kingdom of Israel. And Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, fell to Assyria in 722 B.C. In teaching um, Old Testament history and also in teaching the minor prophets, I've primarily said that there's only two dates that you really need to remember what those dates are to understand the Old Testament. This is one of them, 722 B.C. The other one is 586 B.C., which is what? 586 B.C. 
the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of the southern kingdom of Judah. What is important is when you are reading something in the Old Testament, you need to know, does it come before 722 BC or afterwards? Same with 586 BC, is that after Israel has fallen but before Jerusalem fell or is it occurring after Jerusalem fell? Those become very important and they can help you understand certain passages in the Old Testament. So 2 Chronicles 30, and I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles tonight to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Right after Kings. And 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 30. And this reveals the apostasy of the remnant of the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel left after the fall of Samaria, Samaria and the captivity of most of these tribes to Assyria because they were, they were actually deported to Assyria. Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, and you know, Hezekiah was king of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. This is kind of like a final call. This is, you know, there, and by the way, there will one day be a final call before the door shuts completely. For the king and his leaders and all the assembly in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at the regular time, which would have been what? The first month. Because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. And the matter pleased the king and all the assembly. So they resolved to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan. Now, if you understand that, that's way south, all the way to the northern border. That they should come to keep the Passover for the, to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, since they had not done it for a long time in the prescribed manner. And we know what they had been done prior to this. They'd done what? They had set up two calves, one at Dan, one at Bethel, and rather than come to Jerusalem, which God had prescribed, then the runners went throughout all Israel and Judah with the letters from the king and his leaders and spoke according to the command of the king. Children of Israel, return to the Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Return, shoot. Then he will return to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Okay, you're the remnant. And do not be like your fathers and your brethren who trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers so that he gave them up to desolation, as you see. Desolate. You know, this was, this was, this was the remnant. This was the last of the last. Now, do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brethren and your children will be treated with compassion by those who led them captive, so that they may come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Now looking ahead to what will one day befall Jerusalem, that was true of Jerusalem. And the, and the captive, captives who were carried away to Babylon, because guess what? There was a returning to the Lord in Babylon. And I say that because if you've ever read the book of Ezekiel, and I know some of you have, do you understand Ezekiel did all of his prophesying in Babylon? And if you're looking at the first chapter of the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel says this, I was down by the river Kibar with all the other captives. 
He's in Babylon. And he said, I looked up and the heavens were opened. There were people of the kingdom of Judah who returned to the Lord. Not everyone, but there were those that was, that was offered. And notice what Hezekiah is saying here to those remnant that's left. So the runners passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun. But look at the response. But they laughed at them and mocked them. There were going to be mockers, and then there were going to be others. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulon humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Hey, we've sinned, and we're returning to the Lord. Also, the hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey the command of the king and the leaders at the word of the Lord. Now many people, a very great assembly, gathered in Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month. So now you're going into Unleavened Bread. They arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, and they took away all the incense altars and cast them into the brook Kidron. Some of you know where the brook Kidron is. Then they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the 14th day of the second month. The priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought the burnt offering to the house of the Lord. They stood in their place according to their custom, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood received from the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the assembly who had not sanctified themselves. Therefore the Levites had charge of the slaughter of the Passover lambs for everyone who was not clean to sanctify them to the Lord. And there were many who were not of both Israel of those tribes that came back, and even in Judah. For a multitude of the people, they, this is what you see, many from Ephraim, Manasseh, and now you get another tribe, Issachar, and Zebulun had not cleansed themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. And one of the reasons is they have been so long in the northern kingdom, they've already lost many uh, of their, their traditions, Many of, even many lost knowledge of what was the proper way to celebrate the Passover. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, may the good Lord provide atonement for everyone. Why? Because they'd forgotten. Many of them probably had lived all their lives in the northern kingdom of Israel. Who prepared for, so the Lord would provide atonement for everyone, who prepares his heart to seek God the Lord God of his fathers, though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And here's the key. Will God listen? Yes. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. So the children of Israel who were present in Jerusalem kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. And Hezekiah gave encouragement to all the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord, and they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. Then the whole assembly agreed to keep the feast another seven days, and they kept it another seven days with gladness. They had some time to make up. For Hezekiah, king of Judah, gave to the assembly a thousand bulls, and 7,000 sheep. And the leaders gave to the assembly a 1,000 bulls and 10,000 sheep, and a great number of priests sanctified themselves. The whole assembly of Judah rejoiced, also the priests and Levites and all the assembly that came from Israel, the sojourners who came from the land of Israel and those who dwell in Judah. So there were those who what? who came down from the north. So there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. And the reason was because the kingdom had separated, divided upon the death of Solomon, and there had never been a joint Passover unleavened bread since the kingdoms had split. Then the priests, the
the Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, to heaven. What I want to show you is that when the call went out, most mocked and said, no, we're not coming. So some heeded. There were those from Asher. This appeal was heeded by some of the remnant. For some from Asher, A-S-H-E-R, Manasseh, I mean, note 35, Manasseh, M-A-N-A-S-S-E-H, and Zebulun, Z-E-B-U-L-U-N, to note, said, this appeal was heeded by some, and it's in note 35. Everybody know where I am? Okay. No. I'm in 35. Assyria, the kingdom of Israel fell to Assyria. And then um, uh, captivity left after the fall of Samaria and the captivity of most of these tribes to Assyria. Yeah, I did. So there were some of the remnant from Asher, A-S-H-E-R, Manasseh, M-A-N-A-S-S-E-H, and Zebulun, Z-E-B-U-L-U-N. And also we know that there were a few from Issachar, I-S-S-A-C-H-A-R, who also came. And they had to humble themselves. It was pretty, can you understand um, how do you humble yourself? You get humiliated. It was probably humiliating for many of the members of these tribes. After all, they had left in a in what uh, we country people call a huff. Left in a huff. We're, we're, we're not out of here. And to come back after all those years and to say we're, we're humbling ourselves because we know this is where the Lord said to come. He, he, God didn't tell them to set up two calves, one at Dan and one at Bethel. Jerusalem, that's where the Passover was to be celebrated. And so they humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem to keep the Passover. And notice, to keep the Passover with their brethren of the southern kingdom, they hadn't considered them brethren for a long time. So one must humble himself or herself to walk in the anointed path. Okay, any questions on 35? Okay, we're going to start on 32 notes. And I want to give you some background information, this background regarding migration. So in 931 BC, so like I said, it was over 200 years that Israel, the northern kingdom had been totally separate from the southern kingdom of Judah. So in 931 BC, after the death of Solomon, his son Rehoboam, R-E-H-O-B-O-A-M, so Rehoboam came to the throne of Israel. We're talking about the United Kingdom of Israel. And at that time, the kingdom of Israel split into two kingdoms. And I've shared before about this. Solomon, I mean, you know, it is hard to have uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. It's 1,000 women. And uh, how many know it takes a lot of money to please a thousand women? <laughs> and uh, hey, I, I, I am one, I know. We like lots of stuff. Can you, you know, you men, can you imagine trying to please a thousand women? <laughs> and by the way, that's what became a snare to Solomon. Because he had so many, and his, it, it was his women 
who led him astray to set up false altars to false gods to please his women who worshiped idols. You know, what you won't do for some people, you'll do for your mate. And God warned him. He said, they'll be a snare to you, and they were. So when Rehoboam comes to the throne, guess what? There's something called, and I know you don't know anything about this, it's called debt. <laughs> National debt. <laughs> we hear about it all the time. And by the way, it's climbing every second. So when he came to the throne, many of King David's advisors, still around, older, I think, and the, some who tried to, tried to counsel Solomon said, Rehoboam, if you will just ease up on the tax burden, that's crushing this people. They will do anything for you. They will serve you even as they served David. And then he had his own advisors, the young whippersnappers, I would say. And here's what they counseled him in today's vernacular. You need to show who's boss. You're king. And you need to go tell them. And by the way, that's exactly what Rehoboam told the people. If you think my father's hand on you was heavy, wait till I get finished with you. Well, you know, that's not the way to win friends and influence people and run a country. So what happened was the ten, ten tribes said, we're out of here. We are not going, we are not going to pay for this debt. We are not going to be le uh, loyal to Rehoboam. And Jeroboam, who had prior to this received a prophecy saying that God was going to rent and, and ten pieces were going to go to him. So these tribes split, called out of Egypt for Jeroboam to come and be king over them, Jeroboam of the tribe of Ephraim. So the kingdom of Israel, kingdom of Israel, consisting of the tribes of Ephraim, Reuben, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Simeon, Manasseh, those kingdoms, and the kingdom of Judah, consisting of the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, and some members of the tribe of Simeon. Simeon was kind of split, so that's why I'm... You remember there was a part of Simeon that was located within the tribal uh, inheritance, lot, land allotment of Judah. So there were some members of the tribe of Judah that obviously were in the, the southern kingdom of Judah and stayed there. So the northern kingdom of Israel continues from 931 B.C., until 722 BC when Samaria is conquered by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom of Judah continued until 586 BC when they were conquered by Babylon, B-A-B-Y-L-O-N, and King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, is, it, is, is that clear to everyone? How do you spell Assyrian? Assyri, Assyrians, A-S-S-Y-R-I-A-N-S. A-S-S-Y-R-I-A-N-S. Okay. What was the date for the Northern Kingdom? Northern Kingdom was 722 B.C. So... The northern kingdom of Israel falls in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom continues until 586 B.C., 136 more years. The southern kingdom of Judah will exist. Now, the term Jew, 
J-E-W. And actually that's not form, it should be from. Automatic spell check is good sometimes. When they do change it, they change it to what they think you meant. And that's not what I meant, I meant from. From Yehuda, which comes from obviously the tribe of Judah, which is the predominantly tribe in Judah, southern kingdom, was, here's the key, was first used to describe the inhabitants of the southern kingdom of Judah. The inhabitants of the northern kingdom of Israel were never called Jews, never called Jews. The first use of the term Jews in the Bible was used in 2 Kings 16.6. And I want us to look there. 2 Kings 16.6. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, captured Elath for Syria and drove the men of Judah from Elath. Then the Edomites went to Elath and, and dwell there to this day. And actually, uh, this is the only place where you actually see uh, Jews used. New King James says the men of Judah. I believe there are other translations, but in the original Hebrew it is Jews. Um, so the first use of the term Jews. The first use of Jew was used in Esther 2.5. In other words, in the Hebrew of 2 Kings 16.6, instead of it saying the men of Judah, it called them Jews, okay? In uh, Esther 2.5, is set where? This is the setting of Esther is in Persia, when Persia took over, conquered Babylon. In Shushan, the citadel, in Shushan the citadel, there was a certain <coughs> Jew. This is the first use of the term Jew, Jew, in the Bible, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. So he was where? He was from the kingdom of Judah. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. And you know the tribes that made up the kingdom of Judah were the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, a small group of Simeon and Levi. So the first use of the term Jew. Why am I telling you this? I want you to remember that because many people mix up those terms. There, there's a difference between Israel and Jew and Jewish, Yehudahite, and you have to keep them separate as we begin to look at the migration of the tribes. Any questions? Okay. So the great wandering of the ten northern tribes, and here's the key, and you will see what I have written there, who were never known as Jews in history. The 10 northern tribes of Israel were never ever referred to as Jews. Okay. Which is kind of interesting because um, even in Judaism today, um, the divisions are you are um, a Levite or a priest or a Kohen, okay, or you're the term in the synagogue is Israel. Because even many in from the southern kingdom who are descendants of those in the southern kingdom don't really know. They just know they are, but they 
really don't know tribal identities, whether they are Benjamite, Yehudahite, Simeon, they don't know. Or one of the other tribes that fell to Judah during times of revival and didn't go home. So remember that the original 12 tribes of the nation of Israel broke up into how many nations? Two nations upon the death of Solomon about 975 BC. The northern two thirds, and they, but how many know that the breakup can take a while? But I mean, the actual, I've given you that. Uh, the northern two thirds of the land containing the ten tribes kept the name Israel, while the southern one third containing the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, with many of the Levites, took the name Judah after the royal tribe. Because obviously the king, Rehoboam, was a Yehudite. He was of the tribe of Judah, the royal tribe. From that time on, they kept their separate existence. From that time on, you had the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Until they were finally merged into a vast migration. Because eventually, there will be also a migration of some from the southern kingdom. And I'll just project this just a little bit to you and tell you that not everyone came back from the Babylonian captivity. Some of them stayed in Babylon. Some of them might, when they were given that freedom, when the Medo-Persian Empire overcame Babylon, they gave them permission basically to be free. And some did come back, rebuilt the city walls, rebuilt the temple. Some did not. Some of them went other places, in very unusual places. And I'm just going to tell you that just take a post-it note and put these three Hebrew letters on that post-it note and put it somewhere in your brain. And the letters are Bet, Resh, and Tav. Transliterated in English, B-R-T. Those letters are going to be very, very interesting as we trace the migration. Now, descendants of the original 12 tribes of Israel are found in many modern nations. Many know they are descendants of Abraham, but many do not. They do not yet know who they are. And I have said this before, and you'll hear me say this probably many times as we go through this study. God gave a promise to Abraham, and that promise to Abraham was that his descendants would be as the stars in the heavens and as the sand in the sea. Can you imagine how many grains of sand there are in the ocean? Oceans. If you've ever, how many have ever gone to a planetarium? I, I know they have a, an awesome one in uh, the Museum of Natural History in Cleveland. And you're, you know, you're laying back, and they make you lay back in these chairs, and you look up, and all of a sudden, it's like, it's like you're out there, and and, and it's like it's almost overwhelming. It, it can really overwhelm you. All these stars. Now, when you think about that, and I, uh, prior to class, we were just having a conversation, and I was talking about New York City. The largest contingency of Jewish people on earth 
outside of the nation of Israel are located in New York City. And there are many, many of them. But how many know all of the Jews anywhere in the United uh, States, in every other country of the world, and Israel, do not add up to the stars in the heavens. But how many know God made a promise? He said, I'm God, I lie not. Which means what? If he said it, it's true. Yes. It's true. Yes. And so then we know there has to be more to it. And I will tell you there is. So in note five says, note that in the Bible there are several major listings of the tribe of Israel. And except for the numbers two and the traditional listing in Genesis 49, which are close, very close, all, A-L-L, -L, I mean what all is, all. All, all the other listings are different. And if you don't remember, Anything else I say tonight, remember this. We should not read anything into these differences. I have heard people wax, not so eloquent, but they've waxed on and on and on about why Dan is not listed in the listing in Revelation. Oh, Dan fell into idolatry. Hello. Every one of the tribes fell into idolatry, and not just the northern tribes. There was a time through the prophet that God said about the kingdom of Judah, it said, your sister, speaking of Israel, was more noble than you. No, that's a pretty big indictment. So they all fell into idolatry. So you can't read anything into that. It has to do with in that time frame what's going to happen it has nothing to do because by the way for all the people that said oh dan's been wiped out because they put up one of those calves in dan how many know that in reading the old testament that there is a tribal allotment for the tribe of dan mm -hmm. in the end time mm -hmm. well it, pray tell who's going to get that tribal allotment if dan has been wiped out just saying, you've got, to, you've got to look at all of what the Bible says. So, note six, members of every, every, every one of the 12 tribes have been scattered. So that means what? Are there members of the tribe of Judah, Levi, and Benjamin that have also been scattered? Yes. Now, I want us to go to 2 Chronicles Chapter 15. Because the Bible has to be what we're looking at. Okay. So in 2 Chronicles, chapter 15, what's happened is King Asa of Judah. And I really like um, what was said to Asa. He was a king of Judah. And uh, the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, a prophet. And I'm going to pick up at verse uh, 2. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. I remember doing a message on this, my goodness, it must have been back in 19, I don't know, 83 something. It says, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And he was saying this to the king. And so he went on to say that for a long time Israel had been without a teaching priest without the law, and they were just kind of doing their thing. And, but in their trouble, they turned to the Lord God of Israel, and they sought him. And I know that that was a promise that we have in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. But it's also a promise in the Old Testament, and they sought the Lord, and he was found by them. 
So now I want us to look at 9. Then he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them. Now here's the key. This call went out from Ephraim. How many know Ephraim wasn't a part of the southern kingdom of Judah? No, they're from the northern kingdom. In fact, they're the most prominent tribe in the northern kingdom of Israel. From Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon. Now here's the key. For they came over to him in great numbers from Israel. Great numbers. Now how many know what great means? So there were great numbers of people from the northern kingdom that said, we're going to return to the Lord. This happened at different times. When they saw that the Lord his God was with him. This is a spiritual principle. Do you know that people will go where the Spirit of the Lord is moving? If they know that God is there and God is moving and people are turning to the Lord, they will go. They will come. And so that's what happened there. So you have the members of these tribes fled to Judah, fled to Judah, the southern kingdom, during the reign of King Asa of Judah. And Asa ruled from 911 to 870 BC. He reigned for 41 years. And then guess what, unfortunately? How many know that there is a truth when it says it's not the one who runs the swiftest, nor the one who runs for a day, but the one who endures to the end. And Asa, King Asa, became diseased in his feet. It was, it was a, a very serious foot illness. And he could have, he, he knew what the cause was. It wasn't just, you say, well, he just happened to get a foot disease. No, feet speak of what? Our walk. Asa's walk. He was walking away. He knew, he knew exactly. Return to the Lord and God would have healed him. But it said he sought the physicians and everything else to avoid what he knew would bring healing. And he slept with his fathers. What a very sad epitaph. But during the revival, when he, he knew God had told him at the very beginning I am with you, Asa, as long as you are with me. That's a spiritual truth. He's with us as long as we are with him. Don't ever let go of his hand. So whether these groups were absorbed into the population, in other words, they were just absorbed and they just became a part of Judah, and they, then they just became, even though they were different tribes, they were called Ilmudites, they, whether they remain distinct groups, you know, we are a tribal group, but we've turned to the Lord, so we're in Judah, or return to their tribal lands is not indicated in the Bible. It could be some may have gone home, some didn't. The Bible doesn't indicate it, so we're not going to speculate. Now, I want us to look at 1 Kings 14.15. Because we want to see what God's saying about his people. Now, this is during this is during the reign of the house of Jeroboam in the northern kingdom. And in verse 15 of the 14th chapter of 1 Kings, it says. Actually, verse 14, Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself, himself, a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day, what? Even now, for the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers. Understand what God's saying. What is God saying? I'm going to uproot this people out of this good land and will, here's the word, scatter. The, I'm going to scatter them beyond the river because they have made their wooden images 
provoking the Lord to anger. Why did God uproot Israel from the land? Because of idolatry. It's very clear. So the Lord declares that he would uproot Israel out of the land and they would be scattered. Scattered. And this was fulfilled in the time of 745 to 722 B.C. The reason why I am giving you this time frame is because if you're going to take a whole population and you are going to um, exile them, you, you can't do it all in one shot. So there were different times of exile, groups of people who were exiled. So Tiglath Pileser, and this is going to be a, a name you're going to encounter, you're going to encounter it often. Tiglath Pileser III, king of Assyria, came to power in 745 BC. And there were actually five different phases of deportation. So it all didn't happen in just one fell swoop. The first wave of deportation of the northern kingdom of Israel begins in 740 BC. So that's when they actually started forcing these people to leave Israel. And in 722 BC, the capital of Samaria falls. The capital of the northern kingdom falls. And the northern tribes are taken captive and they are driven by the Assyrians into, into the Caucasus region. And here's where I want you to begin to think because you're, we're going to encounter these locations. Now we're going to encounter these locations years later. So they took them in, into the area of the Caucasus region. And if you've ever had your DNA done, and it'll come out and it'll give you that, that you'll see that term on DNA reports, Caucasus. Um, just kind of make a little note of that in your own mind, if you have seen that. And that region is between the Black and the Caspian Seas. And I want you to look at your maps. I, if, if you're at home, uh, the only thing I can tell you to do is if you call in to the church and give us your address, we will mail you a copy of the migration map. I actually got a couple. Um, we're talking. We're looking at the top one tonight. So you can. It, so the Caspian Sea is way over here on your map. Okay. The seas are dark. There are the dark colors in your map. And the Black Sea is here. So we're talking about this area into here. The tribes were driven into this area. So you can see Assyria. Okay, here, Assyria. And then they were driving them up into this area, bordered on the Black and Caspian Seas. And I said, see the map of Israel's wandering, so you can try to find that. So has everybody, has everybody found the Black and Caspian Seas in the area I'm talking about? So not only did they take the ten tribes of the house of Israel, but here's what's interesting. Assyria also took many from the other two tribes of Judah because they just didn't they just didn't come down and create havoc in the northern kingdom of Israel. They also skirted into the area of the southern kingdom of Judah when they took all the fortified cities of the house of Israel. And you can read about that, and the Bible is our guide. Stop my Bible. Uh, 
if somebody can come and get that for me, I will just, um, I mean, there are some scriptures I know, unfortunately, uh, that one, I know what it's about, I just don't know, I can't quote it from memory. So now you know we're definitely live, because if I wasn't live, we would have cut the, we would have cut it off, and then we would have spliced it together, and, and we didn't. So thank you very, very much for doing that for me. So in 2 Kings, chapter 18, 2 Kings, chapter 18. And verse 13. And in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, now we have another king, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. So what happened? Well, these 10 cities, he overcame them. So these captives from Judah likely went with the house of Israel over the Caucasus mountains, okay, after the power of Assyria was broken. Okay, so in other words, they're there. And many of these, of what I'm, I'm wanting you to begin to see is rather than coming back to Judah, they, when they were when Assyria was overcome, there in that area, they did what? They just went over the mountains. They kept, they kept going, okay? So they likely just went over the mountains after the power of Assyria was broken. Now, when the kingdom of Judah was taken in 586 BC by Babylon, And by the way, I've skipped like 136 years, just so you can know. Okay. Not all the captives and their descendants returned to Jerusalem following the exile. In fact, only about 50,000 returned, and we believe it might have been a little bit less than 50,000. So if you hear someone say, oh, it was 49,000, 45,000, we're just guesstimating 50,000. So guess what? You're in Babylon. You've been in Babylon 70 years. How many know that 70 years you're going to have a few generations, you know, different age groups a lot. You've lived, let's say you've, you know, you've lived 50 years in Babylon. You've probably got children and grandchildren. And understand when the Medo-Persian Empire took over Babylon, then you were given freedom, and there were some children of Judah who even rose in the ranks of Babylon. You had Daniel, you had, you had, you had people who rose, who had, who had uh, careers that they had established in Babylon. You had others who rose to prominence in the Medo-Persian Empire. So when they were given their freedom, some remained in Babylon because their professions were there, they had, built, they had built homes there, they had built a life there. Then there were those who, when they had their freedom, they heard what it was like in Jerusalem. Wasn't good. The walls were broken down, there were enemies all the way around, and some of them would have migrated after they were given freedom and they likely uh, migrated somewhere other than back to Jerusalem. And by the way, their descendants are somewhere today. And by the way, the, the closer we get to this, the more interesting it's going to become. But they still left breadcrumbs for us. Remember what I told you about the letters? I want you to keep remembering B R T. So note that the language of that day spoke of a family, the family of, sometimes they call it family. It spoke of a tribe. So when you read these books, you're going to see 
the term family, the family of, the tribe of, or even a whole nation was sometimes spoken of as a house. That's going to be very, very important because there's going to be a time in the northern kingdom of Israel when the kingdom of Israel was named for a king. And the Assyrians actually called the northern kingdom of Israel after the name of this king. And I'm just kind of telescoping some things. They called, the Assyrians called the name of the kingdom of Israel, the house of Omri. And we know that. That's not something I'm just dreaming up. The Assyrian records called them that. It's just that it's a little bit different in, in looks and pronunciation when it sees in the, when you see it in Assyrian, Akkadian. Um, so the Bible mentions God's references to the house of Israel, right? O house of Israel, O house of Judah. So even God uses this reference. Also, the phrase was used in those days to refer to a nation as the house of a great king who ruled it. And that's why I said this, the importance of this will become significant as we begin to trace the tracks of migration because they'll take their name with them in some form. Now, Three Assyrian kings were involved in the subjugation and deportation of Israel, and I'm talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. You've already been introduced to one of them, Tiglath-Pileser III. Okay. His ruler here in 745 to 727 BC. And then Shalmaneser V, 727 to 722 BC. And now you're seeing some dates. You're beginning to see some overlapping. And Sargon II, 722 to 705 BC. These deportations, and I've told you there were um, three kings. There were basically five deportations, but three kings involved. And not only are these deportations detailed in the Bible, and by the way, the Bible's true. We, we, we accept the truth of the Bible by faith. We don't need the Assyrian records to, to uh, confirm, oh, so now I can believe the Bible. No, it's just exciting when we know what the Bible said, and then the secular records, archeological records, historical records say, oh yes, that is what happened. But the Assyrian records confirm the biblical account. Now, I want us to look at 2 Kings 15, and then I'm gonna go through the note I gave you there. In 2 Kings 15, verses 27, 28, and 29. In the 52nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, became king over Israel in, again, see the term Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and reigned 20 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Every one of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. There wasn't a good king. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and took Ijon, Abel, beth Maacah, Genoa, Kadesh, Hatsor, Gilead, and Galilee. At least Galilee should be familiar with you, to you, right? And all the land of Naphtali. If you know anything about Naphtali, remember when Jesus came and said, uh, in, the, in the area of the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, the light has shined. Well, that's that area around the Galilee. 
and he carried them captive to Assyria. So Pekah uh, came and attacked Judah and um, took them captive. So inscriptions of Tiglath Pileser. Now that's what the Bible said. Okay, we all know what the Bible said. And by the way, what the Bible said is absolutely the truth. But inscriptions of Tiglath Pileser, who are, which archaeologists have dug up, are in museums today. And I thought I had a picture somewhere, and I'm not sure what I did with that picture. It's somewhere around here. Oh. Ah, never mind, I have it. It's here later. Okay, um, and one of these says this. The cities of Galaza, that's a Syrian for Galilee. So we read the Bible where it talked, he took Galilee, right? Mm -hmm. The cities of Galaza, Abilka, a Syrian for Abel Beth Maaka, you read it in the Bible, which are on the border of Bit Humria, Humari, and that is a Syrian for House of Omri. King Omri was considered a great king in the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom was referred to as the house of Omri. And so they're saying these were on the border of what we would say Beit Homria or Humari, or house, it was on the borders of the house of Omri. The whole land of Naphtali in its entirety. Did we, did we read about Naphtali? Yes. In the, this uh, ascription that he writes here, inscription, he says all of this. He said, I have brought within the border of Assyria. So what did he do? He just went down and said, now you're in Assyria. My official, I set over them as governor the land of Bit Humria, all of its people, together with all their goods, I carried off to Assyria. Pahaka, and that's Assyrian for Pika. So what is he saying? I have deposed Pika, their king I deposed Post, and I placed Asi as king. Now here's what's very interesting. Let me find it. Okay. You have somewhere in your notes, and um, if you don't have them handy, that's fine. But if you will look down here, you have um, Pika. Okay, King Pika, and um, he got, became king because he overthrew Pekahiah, who was the king before him. And then you'll see the king after him is the king Hosea, and it said Hosea overthrew Pika. Okay, but in confirmation, he said, I placed Ash Asi. Well, that's Assyrian for Hosea. So what are you seeing? You are seeing Assyrian records that follow exactly what the Bible said. We're taking our description from the Bible, but do you see how exciting it is when you say, oh, well, it even lines up with what happened. So, in confirmation of this change in Kings, we read in 2 Kings 15.30, Then Hosea, the son of Elah, led a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Rem Remaliah, and struck and killed him. So he reigned in his place in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. So he said, I, I put Osi there. He said, okay, you got to go. 
So the conquest began in the northeastern and northern parts of the kingdom about 740 BC. So it didn't happen all at once. And then it worked down to the heavily fortified capital city of Samaria, which was captured in 722 BC. Any questions? Yes. Is it all clear? Yes. Okay. The last two uh, on 12. Oh. Uh, Pika, okay. Hosea made a conspiracy against Pika and killed, killed him. Killed him and reigned in his place. Reigned in his place. Or moved in his place. It was the same meaning. So you see that the Assyrian records and the Bible are identical on what happened. And so begins there and then um, I'm trying to look at time. Um, uh, how many want to call it quits for tonight? How many don't want to call it quits for tonight? How many, how many don't know what you want? I'm asking people sitting in front of me. I had one person say, I don't want to call it quits. I want to know a little bit more. Okay, let me ask again. How many want to call it quits for tonight? How many don't want to call it quits for tonight? Okay, well, for all of you that just kept your hands down, I'm going on. I'm only going to go on for a few, only because I want to stop, because before we get to 17, Note 17 about the black obelisk. I, uh, I have a whole bunch of extra notes to give you. So, and I don't want to do that tonight because that will probably really explode your head. So I don't want to do that. So I will go on. In 732 BC, in 732 BC is 10 years before the fall of the capital of the Northern Kingdom. 10 years before the fall of Samaria, the Assyrian king Tiglath Pileser the third sacked Damascus. Now, how many know where Damascus is? Some Syria, and it, and so it sacked Damascus and Israel, annexing Aramea and the territory. Now, here we're going to actually get tribal territories of the northern kingdom of Israel. So this is ten years before the fall of Samaria. He comes down and he annexes the territory of the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh in Gilead. And remember, there was, there was a half tribe of Manasseh that was on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Remember, Manasseh was, was a tribe divided. They, they decided they wanted... They, they thought it looked better over there, and they got permission to cross the Jordan. Okay. The leader of the tribe of Reuben, <coughs> along with the people of these tribes, were taken and resettled. R-E-S-E-T-T-L-E-D. They were resettled in the region of the Kabar River system in Assyria. So they're actually uprooted from where their tribes were located and they were taken and they were uh, relocated near the Kabar River in Assyria. It's really hard to see the Kabar River on this map. But obviously they were taken into Assyria. So they're taken totally out of the northern kingdom of Israel into Assyria. Now, Tiglath Pileser also captured the territory of Naphtali. So now he's going to come west, and we know that Naphtali, we know all about Naphtali. That's in the area around the Galilee, so you're kind of putting that picture in your mind. And part of West Manasseh. Remember I said there, there were two locations. If you will look at your tribal maps, 
uh, when you go home tonight or before you leave here. If you'll look at that, you'll see that there was the eastern part of Manasseh on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and then there was a western tribal allotment for Manasseh on the west side of the Jordan River. And so now he had already taken the eastern tribe of Manasseh. Now he takes part of the western tribe of Manasseh, west Manasseh. And an Assyrian governor was placed over the region of Naphtali. Now, that's what Assyrian history tells us. Let's look and see what the Bible says. 2 Kings 15, 29. It's exactly what it says. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came and took Ijon, Abel, Beth Maaka, Genoa, Kadesh, Hatsor, Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Assyria. And according to 2 Kings 16:9. So the king of Assyria heeded him, for the king of Assyria <coughs> went up against Damascus, isn't that what, what I said, the record says, and took it, carried its people captive to Kir and killed Rezin. So according to 2 Kings 16.9, the population of Aram and the annexed part of Israel, so whatever they had previously said, this. remember what I said, he went down and said, this is now part of Assyria. Well, now he annexed it. You know, sometimes there's a part you say, well, really, this belongs to us, and then now um, we're going to actually annex it. Make it, we're going to make it legal that it is part. So he annexed um, the part of Israel that was deported to Assyria. A-S-S-Y-R-I-A. -S -S they marched, now they're taking, actually physically taking captives and marching them. They marched the captives from Israel's northern and eastern borders. Now they're physically marching the captives. Shalmaneser became king in 727 B.C., and he ruled until 722 B.C., the fall of the capital. And then Sargon II came to power, as often happened in that area, by seizing power from Shalmaneser and a palace coup. Oh, I'm going to be leader now, and so I'm gone. So Israel continued to exist within reduced territory. So in other words, there was a small contingency of population uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel as an independent kingdom, but subject to Assyria. In other words, they've annexed it. Now it's been annexed. So you are now just a, an independent territory, kind of doing your thing with a really reduced population, subject to Assyria. In other words, you're a part of Assyria. Until 722 BC, when it was again invaded by Assyria, and the remaining population was deported by Sargon II. So now you, by this time now, what all of the northern kingdom of Israel, for the most part, has been taken to Assyria. Okay. Still on 15, Sister Sharon, uh, independent kingdom. Subject, S-U-B-J-E-C-T, -E subject. So they, they had to answer to Assyria the whole time. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm going to do 16 and then I will stop and read uh, because before 17 I have some notes that I want to give you. Okay. What? I'm sorry. What? Deported. Deported. 
Oh, I know, I know. That. Yeah, I was going to have deported in there, and then I typed it because I was probably half asleep when I was doing it. So I usually, I usually stay over in in uh, later when I do these notes after I get everything else done that I get done during the day, and I'm, I usually have my half an eye open when I'm doing that sometimes. And I am going to stop after 16. The Assyrians, then what the, the Assyrians did was they drafted many of the able-bodied men of the tribes of Israel into their army. Basically, they just said to them, you are now members of the Assyrian army. And then they positioned, and there's a reason for this, listen to what they did to them, and positioned them on the Assyrian frontier as buffers between themselves and neighboring enemies, such as the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, why would they do that? Anyone? They drafted able-bodied men of the tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel, said, you're in our army now, and you're going to be the soldiers on the border. And we got enemies, and you're going to have to protect us against the enemies. Well, who dies first? Yeah. They do. Okay. We'd rather put these children of Israel, kingdom of Israel, these soldiers, we'd rather put them on the border and they'll fight for their own life than if they get killed, at least it's not Assyrians who are getting killed. Nice people. So the Bible explains how Assyria transported and resettled this Ten tribes of Israel. And this is going to be very important in 2 Kings 17, 5 and 6. Now I want you to look at your map if you want to. And there's a reason. Uh, if you are going to look, um, then there, some of them are going to be hard to find on this map. There might be a, um, it might be easier to see on it another one, but you'll see some of them. If you will look over into this area where I said that they sent them, um, okay. Do you see the circle on your map? Over here, all the way to right where it says media? Okay. Do you, okay, I want you to look at the two names, and then there are others around there too. But I want you to look at these two names and see if you will see them when I read what I'm going to read. Okay, so 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. Now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, okay, Asi, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria okay, and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. So we know exactly from the Bible where they were placed where that group of people was placed. So we know exactly. Now we know that there were others that are already up here where? In between the Black and the Caspian Sea. So they're in this same general area right now because that's where they placed them because they wanted them to do what? You got, you've got Persia right there. And we know that eventually the Medo-Persian Empire does indeed take down Assyria. So you see, they put them around there. Why? Well, that's, your, that's our buffer. They'll kill them before they get us. And they'll fight for their lives, their own lives, to protect us. So they were brought to these, and in the cities of the Medes, this was the area near the Caspian Sea. Okay. Questions, comments? Uh, I know this is a lot, but it is going to it is going to come in. It's going to be like P 
pieces of the puzzle, but they're all going to come together. Um, and like I said, next week I'm going to be giving you some additional notes that are not in your notes. Because I'm going to give you more notes and um, on the House of Omri and how is that going to look as, as we move in time. But you know that names change over time. And that's how we're going to look down. Um, and, uh, it gets, I, I know it's not good English for an English teacher to say this, but it's going to get gooder and gooder as we go, as we go along. It really is. If you're out there and, and you have questions, and maybe you do, um, please feel free to call and leave your question. We will answer them. If you have a prayer request, please know that we care about you and we are praying for you. And if you would like to give in response to the teaching you receive, I've given you the ways that you could do that. And know this, God has a plan and he is working his plan and he will bring his plan to completion and fulfillment. Not only his plan for mankind, but his plan for your life. Know this, you are important to God and he has a plan for your life. Yield to him and watch him unfold the best plan that you could ever imagine. The Lord loves you. And I will just tell you, no matter who you are, maybe you've just accidentally flipped through this out of curiosity. But know this, God loves you. He loves you. And his call to you tonight is, turn to me that I may turn to you. And the same words he gave to King Asa, he's giving to every one of us. I am with you as long as you are with me. Have a great evening and trust in the Lord. <laughs>